Okay, okay. So, uh, a very warm welcome to you all to second of the special lecture series in social linguistics by Professor Maya David. She, we are al already familiar with her uh, work and her lecture as well. So, I wouldn't waste any time reintroducing her to our students and our guests. I uh, just request Professor David to start her lecture. And before that, I would request um, uh, Obhik to please uh, uh, inform our guests about uh, the technicalities and start the presentation. Yeah, hello and uh, good afternoon, everyone. We would request everyone to keep their mics on mute. And if you have any questions or queries for the speaker, please write it down in the chat section and the organizer will uh, convey it to the speaker, OK? Thank you. Yes, Maya, you can start now. Yes. H hello, everybody. Nice to meet you again after about a month. Uh, I hope you are all keeping well, despite the COVID situation, in spite of the COVID situation. And I think, Avik, Avik, are you going to do my PowerPoints again? Uh, yes, ma'am. All right. So the first PowerPoint then. I'm happy to see friends from Malaysia and the Philippines also here. Right, so the topic for today, as I discussed with uh, Prof Aditi, is on language maintenance, language shift and language revitalization. This is a topic which is very close to my heart because my doctorate dissertation many years ago was on language maintenance and language shift and more recently i am working on issues of language revitalization now the topic is very very wide so the second slide will now show you the range of topics and themes and new new terminology maybe uh, in relation to this topic so there are a whole lot of issues with regards to maintenance and shift and uh, revitalization. And I will first discuss the variables that can cause shift and focus also on the issue of domains and what it means. Um, and move on to levels of endangerment, types of death, because even the issue of death that is a terminology that we can discuss, whether it's called suicide, language suicide or language murder, depending on who, who is committing the suicide or who is committing the murder. And I will also move on to something fairly new, which is the issue of new speakers. And then there are certain terminologies which I would like to mention. That's number five on the slide. Uh, and also issues of identity. Do you, when you lose your language, do you lose your identity? Or is language an integral part of identity? I will then move on to some studies to show you the methodology used in maintenance and shift studies by different researchers in different parts of the world. And finally, if we have time, I will talk to you about language contact and language borrowing and which impacts more on shift and i would also uh, talk about the ethics of collecting data and the issue of consent form provided time allows us to do this okay so we move on to the next slide now definitions i'm sure you have heard these definitions what is language maintenance? It comes from the basic meaning of maintain. So it's the continuing use of a language despite, despite the fact that there are other more dominant languages in the region, more powerful uh, languages, languages that empower them, they, but that this community will still maintain its language because it has pride in using its language. Language shift, on the other hand, denotes the replacement of one language by another as the primary, and this is the focus, the primary means of communication within a community. 
the shift, for example, my studies have been on the Sindhi language in Malaysia. So the shift away from Sindhi in Malaysia by the Malaysian Sindhi community, it shows shift without death because Sindhi is still widely spoken in Sindh in Pakistan and it's being revitalized in different parts of India too by language activists. As I mentioned earlier, do we call it language suicide or language murder when there is a death? Is it a suicide or is it a murder? Well, the normal term of suicide is when a person takes his own life. In the same way, language suicide is when the community itself decides that its mother tongue is not empowering them and so they shift to another language. Murder, Philipson actually says that uh, many minority and small languages are being murdered by the majority language. And in this case, he was focusing on English and how English has resulted in the murder of many small regional minority languages. Next slide, please. So there are many, many variables to be considered for language shift and why people move away from their heritage language. Uh, and I've put as the first point there a whole range, but let's, let's focus on the major issues, although there are many, many issues which cause language shift. And in the last lecture, if you were here, I talked to you about uh, Susan Gell's work and how the women decided to shift to German rather than Hungarian because they wanted to move upwards socially and economically upwards. So that was Susan Gell's work way back in 1979 when she looked at a study in Oberwart. But uh, there are many, many other factors which cause language shift and uh, <clears throat> we can sort of... Uh, classify them according to social factors, economic factors, demographic factors, natural disasters, expansion of empires, migration. So let's take them slowly one by one so that I can elaborate on each of them. Uh, social factors, and I will give you examples from my own study of the Sindhi community in Malaysia. It's a small community, about 800 people, and um, in a population of about 33 million people, it's very, very small, so its language is a minority of a minority language, and many of the uh, men in the community are involved in businesses, and in these businesses, they have to talk to people using majority languages or dominant languages like the national language Malay or the English language. Uh, in the old days, when they first came to Malaysia, they were catering to the English colonial class and they brought in material to sell and so they spoke in English. But these days, catering to Malaysians, they tend to move between Malay, English, even uh, um, Mandarin, if they have learned Mandarin. So they're very multilingual because multilingualism brings them the ability to make money, to, to stay on in their occupations. And many of the young Sindhis today have become lawyers and doctors and so on, and they tend to use more of English when meeting with patients or clients. Uh, so the social factors and the economic factors are sort of interrelated. We move on to demographic factors. If you remember Susan Gell's uh, 1979 study, she actually talks about the, the women who moved to the factories in the city and then they married the Germans. So marriage comes in and uh, when you marry somebody of another ethnic group, another language tendency is to shift, not always, but there is a tendency to shift to the language of what you consider socially and economically upward community. And that's what the Hungarian women did. But the young men uh, uh, of the same age group as the women who stayed on in the farms, it, so that's the rural areas, they stayed on in the farms, 
they still spoke Hungarian. So you have gender issues coming in, you have rural urban issues coming in, and marriage coming in. So it's although I'm saying it as one factor or the other factor, sometimes there is a combination of factors which work together at the same time to cause shift. And of course, uh, you can have what they consider natural disasters, for example, and this is an example provided in many textbooks on uh, how language shift occurs, the eruption of um, a volcano in an island caused the death of 80,000 native speakers of that language, Tamboran, and resulted, of course, in the death of the language. And when empires expand, people move on, people migrate, they move on to different areas, and then they use the language of the dominant community. Migration is another major factor for language shift. Um, many of us, uh, we talk about migration, moving away from our country, but there's also internal migration within a country you move to the urban area. So you have migration outside your country and you have migration within your country to urban areas. In a recent study that I did with a fellow linguist in Pakistan, <coughs> we looked at migration to the city from from the heartland where Sindhi was spoken to the cities like Karachi, where the Sindhis were not that a majority community and they wanted to speak Urdu, the national language and English. So there was a slight shift away from the mother tongue. So sometimes you have internal migration and sometimes you have external migration. Uh, for example, and again, I'm using an example that I have worked with of a community. The Sindhis are found in America, in England, and ev everywhere they have moved, they have tended to move to the dominant language used in that community. And that results in less use of their own mother tongue and sometimes hardly any use with, their younger, with the younger members of the community. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So migration within the country, migration out of the country. Let's move on to other examples. I've been focusing too much on the Sindhis. Let's move on to Wales, where educated youngsters in the rural heartlands of the Welsh language moved to the towns and back to better job prospects. And so uh, the Welsh language was lost. But the Welsh government is very, very aware of the importance of using the mother tongue, and so it is currently being revitalized by uh, two uh, government bodies, the Welsh Language Board and the Welsh Assembly Government, through new patterns of education and through the medium of Welsh. So today, the status of Welsh is, has increased. I remember years ago when I went to Wales, I even not so many years ago, but I remember seeing even the signboards. The signboards were all uh, in Welsh and English was below the Welsh language. So there has been a, 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 a change in the demand for education in Welsh, both at the, uh, at the nursery level, at the primary level, and even at secondary education. So uh, if you want to read more about uh, the revitalization Revitalization simply means the language being uh, encouraged to be used again. Um, this is by Nicholas Kuplan and Aldrich in International Journal of the Sociology of Language. Now, another issue which could cause language shift for a community to move away from its mother tongue is issues of nationalism, politics, power, and the education system. I have married all these things together because, for example, in Malaysia, what happened with independence from the British government, then there was a, a feeling, both in Malaysia and even in the Philippines, that the country should have its own national language. 
to help people with different languages all come together and unite. So Malaysia focused on Malay as the national language and Philippines focused on Filipino, initially called Pil uh, Filipino, but called Pil with a not with an F, but with a P, and then shift the change to Filipino to make the people feel that this was a language for all of them. But even in Malaysia, when they decided on Malay, the decision was a bit uh, slow because which, which dialect of Malay? We have so many dialects of Malay. And I think in the Philippines too, that was the same issue of there are so many varieties, uh, so many languages, which language should be the language to, to bring the people together. So forces of nationalism result in the education system also being changed. So where we had English as the medium of instruction under the colonial government, we then had Malay as the medium of instruction uh, after a number of years after independence. So, uh, so what happens then is minority communities will feel that their language is not important. It's more important to learn the national language. And also in both the Philippines and in Malaysia, English was also seen as the second most important language. And this is ha has happened even in Pakistan, where English is considered as a very important language, even though Urdu is the national language. And in India too, English is used in many official uh, domains, even though Hindi is an important official language. So a language shift by a community may be caused because of changes at the top level by government, because of nationalism, because of politics, and a change in the education system. Removing a language from the education system suggests that it has little worth. And so students um, stop using that language even in the home domain because they, they see the other language, the majority language, the medium of instruction language as being more important for their own growth. Now, we also need to focus at the people in the community, the different generations in the community and their view of the language of their own mother tongue. Some parents may take an active decision not to bring up their children bilingually. They may think that the heritage language will have limited value to the child in the new country. I remember, even though it was many years ago, that the Cindy grandparents said to me, they are learning Malay, they are learning English in school. What use is Cindy for them here in Malaysia? So when grandparents and parents have this view of their own mother tongue, chances of it being transmitted to the young generation is very nominal. And when languages are not transmitted by older members of a community to younger members of a community, there is a great chance of language shift and slowly language death. So, although I've mentioned a whole range of factors that can cause language shift, we cannot see them in isolation. They are all sort of, uh, they merge with each other and sometimes, uh, one factor impinges on another factor. So there's no single set of factors that can be used to predict the outcome of, uh, of whether a community is going to maintain its language or not. Uh, but basically, we can group them as economic factors, uh, socioeconomic factors, business factors, demographic changes, migration, institutional support, political support, and the status of the other languages within the, uh, within the nation. So can we move on then? I now want to move on to an important concept that was used by Joshua Fishman years ago when he did one of the very early studies of language shift. He talked about the issue of domains. 
and uh, when Fishman did his first study, he, he used a questionnaire study, but I'll talk to you about methodology in a short while, but he used a questionnaire study and focused on the domain concept. And in 1989, when he talked about domains, he, he determined a range of domains, the family domain, the friendship domain, the religious domain, education, employment. But really, if you are going to do a study of language shift or language maintenance, uh, the number of domains you choose to study depends on the community you are studying. So, for example, when I looked at the Sindhi community in Malaysia, for me, it was not necessary to look at the education domain because Sindhi was not being used in schools. Employment domain, um, many Sindhis were not working for Sindhi employers. So, again, chances of Sindhi being used with a non-Sindhi speaker were minimal. So, I focused on family domain home domain. I focused on friendships, who were their network of friends, and also on religion. So the number of domains you study depends on where your community is situated and what the education system and employment levels, uh, whether their mother tongue is needed in these uh, spheres, whether in education or employment. But definitely, you need to look at the home domain. You look, you have to look at their friendship, who are their network of friends, are they members of the same community? If they are members of the same community, are they using the mother tongue when talking to friends from within the community? And of course, their religion, have they retained their link? religion or have they shifted away from their religion? If they have retained their religion, are they using a mother tongue in the religious domain? So you have to look at public domains and private domains. So the public domains may be government domains. So for example, in Malaysia, in the early years after independence and after Malay was introduced as the national language, when you met up with civil servants, it was often better to speak the national language if you wanted to ask for something or you had to go to the income tax department or something like that. So. These are your public domains. In schools, Malay was the national language. You spoke to your teacher in the classroom, perhaps you, and if, you know, perhaps then you would use the Malay language. So uh, in informal domains and personal domains, like the home domain, you would have to study it to see whether the community is using its language. Also, it's in its songs, in its stories, because as Joshua Fishman said, the home is the last bastion of survival for the dominated language. But even the religious domain is important, and the literary domain, uh, the folklore, folk songs, stories, are they being told in their mother tongue or not? Right, so we move on from domains. And I really want to talk to you about domains. When we talk about domain, just now I gave you the general view of domains, the home domain, the school domain, and so on. But basically, when we talk about domain, we are looking at participants, location, and topic. So for example, a mother talking to a daughter in the home domain, and she's talking about education. Would she use her mother tongue? or would she use another language? If a mother is talking to the daughter in the kitchen and she's explaining to her about a recipe, something she is cooking, would she use her mother tongue or would she use another language? So when we talk about domains, it's a constellation of who is speaking to whom where, and even if it's in the home domain, whether it's in the kitchen, it's in the sitting room, whether other people are around, is the father around, is the grandfather around, for example, and the topic that is being discussed. So when we talk about domains, you, you have to remember we are looking at participants, 
location and the topic. And that will determine the choice of language used. So, for example, I noticed in my study, uh, I noticed that when a mother was talking to the, uh, was actually uh, scolding the daughter, she would revert back to the Sindhi language. But when she was uh, asking the daughter for a favor, then she would use uh, English because they were more shifting towards English. So participation, participant, location, and topic becomes important. And if people start moving to another language away from their mother tongue, even in the home domain, then there is a great chance that language shift will occur as the language loses the last bastion of where the language should be used. All right. So as I said earlier, you don't have to study all the domains. It depends on the community you are studying. And here I would like to show you a study by a Malaysian uh, from um, Sarawak. Uh, Malaysia, as you know, we have East Malaysia and West Malaysia. So she was looking at the language use of three major groups. We have many major groups. Uh, in fact, we have 130 over languages in the country. But she was looking at the three major groups in the Malaysian state of Sarawak. So you can study a a, a, a region like a, a, a region like as the state of Sarawak, or you can study a community in a, in a city, for example, in Kuala Lumpur or in your own city. The, the and what she did was she looked at six domains and she looked at a large sample, roughly about nine hundred over people, and three communities: Malay, Chinese, and Iban. And in Peninsula, we would look at Malay, Chinese, and Indians. But here, Iban, the Iban community is a big community in, in Sarawak. So she looked at these communities and she looked at three major towns, not one town, but three towns. And she showed that, the, that these people from the different ethnic groups in Malaysia had moved on to Malay and they used more Malay than English. So it shows the success of the national language policy in the education domain. Uh, but she also noticed that the Chinese were moving more towards Mandarin. Uh, so they had another language that they could move on to. So when we talk about language shift, it doesn't necessarily mean that the community that you are looking at, maybe they belong to different ethnic groups, and maybe the different ethnic groups will shift to different languages for different reasons. And in this case, the Chinese community, where the Iban community moved to Malay, the Chinese community was moving to Mandarin. Um, because Mandarin, for the community, they saw it as a language with international standing. And it also was a symbol of their cultural solidarity. So, uh, so <coughs> it, national language was important, but Mandarin for the Chinese community was also important. I'm showing you these studies to show you that you can focus on uh, uh, people of an ethnic group in a city, or you can look at two or three major towns within your own region. And you can look at different ethnic groups, and you can look at their attitude towards different languages within the same state. All right, now can we move on? I now want to move on to levels of endangerment and types of death. Now, I will first talk about Fishman and his idea of levels of endangerment. Fishman had an eight level graded intergenerational disruption skill, in short, called GITS. And many researchers have used Fishman's uh, scale to, to analyze and to evaluate 
the, the, the level of language endangerment. And uh, basically what he did was he looked at the issue of children and parents. And his focus was on uh, if children did not learn a language from their parents, that there is little possibility that they in turn will be able to pass the language on to their children. Let me give you an example. Uh, my daughter-in-law, her, 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 her mother tongue is not being used at all in the home domain because her mother married an Englishman and so her mother did not speak her own language in the home domain. So now, my daughter-in-law with my grandchildren, she makes her, her mother tongue just as a symbolic language. So when there's a birthday, they will use this symbolic language to sing the birthday song and they'll put up the flag of the country she or her mother originally came from to, to represent this notion of identity with that country. But really, living in England for so many years and only speaking English in the home domain with her mother as she was growing up, uh, she sees herself as a speaker of English. Her dominant language is English. So what Fishman was doing is he was looking at language. If you don't learn it from your parents, what is the chance of you using it on to your children? Right? So, uh, so Fishman focused on intergenerational transmission. And he said this was a decision made by parents, but not only this was a decision made by parents, but it was also the decision was made due to societal and institutional choices. As I gave you the example, the grandfather decided, I'm not going to use Cindy with them. i rather use English with them. They will learn Malay in the school. They will learn English from me. This was the Malaysian Cindy grandparent. So he made this parental decision regarding the language he wanted to speak with his grandchildren. And so his grandchildren, their dominant language is today English, no more Cindy. So these are the social factors that Fishman talked about in, in his gates. Now, more recently, UNESCO came up with a six level scale of endangerment. What do I mean by this? This is an alternative framework for assessing the status and vitality of languages in danger that UNESCO talked about. And they had six grades within the nine factors they mentioned. They had six grades from zero to five. And you will determine looking at the language, observing the language, uh, you, the researcher, determine should I put zero as no nil use or five as maximum use to show vitality, zero to show endangerment, or in between. Uh, zero to five, what level should I put? So UNESCO also focused, like Fishman, on intergenerational transmission. Basically, if the parents or grandparents don't use the language with the children, chances of it being used are nominal. There is danger of language shift. Yes, we can move on. Now, at no low, came up with another set of five categories. So if you are doing a study on language shift and language maintenance, you have to decide whether you want to use Fishman or you want to use UNESCO or you want to use Ethnologue. Uh, Ethnologue came up with five categories to characterize language vitality. Um, and here they look at first language speakers. So their focus was not so much on, on intergenerational use. They were looking at who are the first language speakers. And I will talk to you about new speakers in a short while um, because not many studies have been done on new speakers. So that was ethnologue. And then more recently, uh, there has been a research uh, known as expanded gates, where they use Fishman's gates, but they asked more questions regarding identity, 
vehicularity and by vehicularity they mean whether the language uh, that mother tongue is being used as a lingua franca or not. They also focus on intergenerational language transmission just like UNESCO did and Fishman did. They also looked at, so because this is expanded, they were also looking at literacy status and like the other studies, they also looked at generational language use. So they expanded on Fishman's gates, basically. So really, if you want to do a study of whether a community is maintaining or has moved away from its language and how, how imminent is language death, you have to decide which of these uh, four that you would like to use whether the UNESCO's or ethnologues or Fishman's or expanded gates. And you must provide a rationale for why you are using which of these. Yes, we can move on. Now, the other thing, I've talked to you a lot on intergenerational uh, language choice. And I now want to move on to language proficiency. Uh, to determine whether speakers are competent in their mother tongue uh, because if they are no longer competent in their mother tongue then uh, then there is a danger of death okay so what are the stages that we can look at in terms of competence so three types of speakers have been shown uh, the first you have young fluent speakers now if you have young fluent speakers who have a native command of their mother tongue uh, then you can say that this language will live and in fact if they show some uh, small deviations from the norms of the older speakers. Uh, maybe they use a few English words here and there, but they are basically using their mother tongue. Then you can say this is showing an emerging variety of the of the mother tongue with minimal with minimal borrowing from other languages, minimal code switching. And these are fluent speakers because the parents have been speaking the language with them in the home domain. And perhaps they even have been learning the language in the school. Now, passive bilinguals are able to understand the mother tongue, but are not able to produce it themselves. So ask yourself, are you a passive bilingual? Can you use your mother tongue proficiently, as proficiently as your grandfather, your grandmother? Uh, of myself, I would say, I, I, I would be more a semi-speaker rather than a passive bilingual because I understand and I can speak the language, uh, but it is not my dominant language. So semi-speakers continue using that ancestral language in a, not a perfect way because they have shifted away from the uh, from the continuous and the dominant use of their mother tongue so which one are you are you a young fluent speaker very fluent in the mother tongue you can use all the words your parents use your grandparents use in the same fl fluency with the same proficiency or are you a passive bilingual? You understand, but you can't speak it. You don't speak it. Uh, and you, are you a semi-speaker where you use the language, but it's not the uh, you know it's not so fluent. It's not so proficient. And so you don't only look at the language uh, choice. You look at the proficiency levels of speakers within the community you are studying, right? Let's move on. Now, we move on to language death. Uh, and there are different uh, types of language death. So when we talk about language endangerment, uh, we, we know that people are moving away from their language, their mother tongue, their ancestral language. But there have been uh, people who have actually distinguished types of death. And Campbell and Munsell in their 1989 study talked about four types of death. One they talked about was gradual death. 
which means the replacement of one language by another, slowly the replacement of Gaelic by English in different parts of Scotland due to attitudes, changes in attitudes. If you think, okay, it's better I know English because I'm going to move to London, for example, and the whole community, uh, a big portion of the community is moving to London to work in London, maybe they will slowly start replacing Gaelic with English. Sudden death. Sudden death, according to Campbell and Munsell, occurs when the language abruptly, very abruptly disappears because its speakers die or are killed. Uh, so there is no intervening period of bilingualism. You just move quickly. The last speaker, I, I would like you, if you have time later, to watch this YouTube of the last speaker of a dying language. And this is the YouTube by Mary Wilcox, who was the last proficient speaker of an Indian, <coughs> of an Indian tribe. And the language was Wukuchumi. So that's a sudden death. A radical death, on the other hand, when a community stops speaking their language to defend themselves. And Campbell and Munsell cite radical death for many American languages when there was an Indian uprising and the community of Indians were massacred. And so they decided we better stop speaking our language so that we are not identified as Indians. So this is where they made this decision because they didn't want to be identified as Indians because there was this fear that if you're seen as an Indian that there will be uh, fear of being killed. And bottom to top death. Bottom to top death is when a language ceases to be used as a medium of conversation. I don't use it to talk to anybody, but I only use it when I go, when I pray or in the religious domain, when there's a community of people meeting and we pray. And so, uh, it may survive in the religious domain or even in the literary songs or the folk songs. And again, maybe if you have time, you would like to look at Old Slavonic on YouTube where they show how languages die. All right? And, you, and now the other, other extreme of language death is ethno-linguistic vitality. And here it simply means that the community as a group behaves, is very proud of its language. With each other, they use their language. In intergroup situations, they use their language and uh, they transmit the language from older generation to younger generation and so on. So uh, this is the community is very, very vital in its use. And I found this when we did our study of the Sindhis in Sindh and in that region of Pakistan, in Sindh itself, we found that the Sindhi community had very high ethno-linguistic vitality. So you can look at the same language in different settings, in different countries, and you can find that in some countries, like in Sindh in Pakistan, Sindhi language has a high ethno-linguistic vitality. I remember when I was leaving the Karachi airport and the lady at the counter, when we were getting our tickets and our immigration passes job, and uh, the lady at the counter was speaking to her colleague in Sindhi. And I was so excited and I turned to my friend and said, they're speaking in Sindhi. And so when she heard that, she, the lady at the counter, was so excited that she started asking me questions in Sindhi and which part of uh, the world I came from. So language which brings people together sometimes. So this idea, whether you are from Malaysia or from Sindh or wherever, the notion of the language brought people together, a common language. So, uh, but the same language in different settings mean in one setting, it may have high ethno-linguistic vitality, but not in another setting. All right, we move on then. 
So we can talk about rap language revitalization. They have a lot of words which basically mean the same thing, or language revival, or reversing language shift. It's an attempt to stop or to reverse the decline of a language, or even to bring back to life, to revive an uh, extinct language, to revive minority languages, to protect them from loss. Because Fishman says within three generations, normally people lose their language, especially if they move away from their homeland. So, um, and so I've seen that in the case of Malaysia, it's within three generations, the Sindhi language has, um, is not being used so much especially by the younger members of the community. I now move on to documenting and use, using uh, the language. Now, there is a link between language. You want to determine whether a community is maintaining a language or whether it's shifting away from the language. And so if it's shifting away, you see there's a potential for language death. If you want to do a research on revitalization, you have to look at the community and see whether the, the language of the community has been documented. Are there documents that you could use to help the community to use the language, to encourage them to use the language? Or do you have to start from scratch and collect data and document the data? For example, when we were looking at a minority uh, group in Malaysia, uh, one of the first peoples of the country, when we were doing a study of them, we had to first document their language because their language had not been documented. And we had to go to their village as a group of researchers. We went to their village and each of us was assigned a different area to talk to them. So for some people, they were looking at numbers. For others, they were looking at things in the house domain, like the kitchen. What do you call the pot in your language? What do you? And others were going to the field, and what do you call the tree in your language? And we were asking questions for um, lexical items. We were asking questions about uh, syntax and grammar and so on. And we had to, we had big issues because we had to have, we had a language barrier. So we would use a um, non-verbal language to point at things and to ask them, how do you say it in your own language? And so we had to first document the language before we can actually encourage them to use the language. So if there's no documentation. So many researchers these days look at documentation issues. Um, so whether you want to do that, you have to first look at the community and see, have they already documented? Are there already documented uh, books, materials of their language? If so, why should you start documenting them? If not, then you have to start and you have to see where is the vacuum, in which area is there a vacuum that you need to document. Are there stories being documented? Is there any knowledge of the number system? Is there any knowledge of their grammar, of their syntax? Is there a need for grammar in their language? So you need to find out all this and then you need to document it. You have to create books. You have to encourage... Uh, not encourage, start maybe mini schools uh, or mini classrooms where the language is being taught. But on the other hand, if the language is already documented, let me give you an example again of the Sindhi language because the language is documented. It's a rich language. There's lots of materials. There are archives of material, libraries of material on the Sindhi language. So we don't have to start from scratch with regards to documentation. But what we need to do is to find out why the community has moved away from the language. How can we encourage people to use the language? So whether you're focusing on documentation or whether you are focusing on psychological issues, attitudinal issues, it will depend on the community, the speech community that you are looking at. 
So let me give you an example of a study that I did in 2018, where I looked at Sindhi activists, cultural and community group members who are using social media to revive Sindhi language and have started Sindhi websites like Learn Sindhi, uh, Sindhi Sati, meaning friendship organizations, Facebook pages, drama programs, uh, songs, stories, nursery rhymes, folk songs, telefilms, so many things all through um, social media to vitalize and revitalize the language and to prevent the language from dying. By the way, moribund simply means the language is dying. So to prevent the language from dying. So the, these entries posted by the activists are, are in Sindhi, but the responses, the comments that came from people watching these drama programs, these plays, these folk songs, these dances, they were generally, unfortunately, they were generally and predominantly in English and very few in the Sindhi language very few in the Arabic script. And even if it was in the Sindhi language, it was Romanized script. So using A, B, C, D, for example, to uh, say words in Sindhi. But basically the responses by people of, uh, watching these uh, uh, things on social media were in English. So the, it is evident by the responses and comments of the respondents that there has not been a shift back towards the use of the heritage language. In other words, they, they can understand, to me, it appears they can understand the Sindhi language, but they're not motivated to revert back to the Sindhi language. They're not motivated to revert to the dominant use of the heritage language, Sindhi. So it shows that Language activists can do a lot. They, they've done a lot. Uh, there's a group in India spearheaded by Asha Chand, uh, and they're doing a lot to encourage the Sindhis to use the Sindhi language. And they're arguing that the use of the language will bring the community together. And they are uh, transmitting these programs all over the world. And right now, like 80 to 90 nations, Cindy's from 80 to 90 nations are observing all these shows. So that obviously is a receptive knowledge of the language, but the productive use as seen in the comments is generally, so far what I've seen is in English. So the active use of the language is not there. So as a researcher, where you want to promote them to use, you want to revitalize the language, your methodology has to be your research has to focus on why have they shifted and how can you encourage them to revert back to their dominant use of their mother tongue. Yes, can we move on? And here is a study that I want to uh, show you about a study in Singapore by Ling in 2016, and she looked at a group of Chinese speakers who, who spoke a dialect of Chinese known as Teochew. Um, and she was focusing on ideologies, and this is what I've been talking about, the ideology of the community. Why are they using their language or not? If not, why not? It, you know, even if it has been documented, what is the ideology that makes them use or not use their language. So she looked at the ideologies of 53 Teochew speakers in multilingual Singapore. Singapore, as you know, is very multilingual. And uh, her focus was the young speakers. And the Singapore government policy is to promote the use of English and Mandarin. But this group of young speakers continued to use Teochew, which they believe could serve not only as a communicative function when speaking with their Teochew-speaking grandparents at home, but its emotional function, since the, the dialect symbolized their core cultural identity. So for these young speakers, Teochew dialect showed their identity as Teochew speakers. 
and they believed and this is a realistic view that living in this multilingual world um, that English was, was good, English helped them to get to Western science technology, Mandarin was good because we had Mandarin schools in Singapore because it focuses on Confucian ethics and values but Teochew, their mother tongue, was an indispensable language that helped them to remember their roots, remember who they were, where they came from. So Teochew is not a very dominant language in the country in Singapore, but these Teochew speakers that were researched had this ideology, had this belief, had this attitude that it's important. It shows us that we are a community, we are a group within a group of Chinese speakers. Other speakers, other Chinese may speak Mandarin, but we are Teochews. We must know Mandarin, but we must in our home domain with our grandparents speak Teochew. And it also with each other, it shows our cultural identity. So that's important. So for them, this attitude is very important. And here, I have put in capital letters in the very first line, I have put the word addictive bilingualism. Now, there's such a thing as subtractive bilingualism and addictive bilingualism. Addictive simply means when you learn another language, does it mean you lose your mother tongue or do you maintain your mother tongue? So if you learn another language, you maintain your mother tongue, it's addictive. You add on to the languages you know. So in this case, they knew English, they knew Mandarin, they knew Teochew. So that's addictive. They added on. They didn't subtract. Subtractive bilingualism is where you lose your mother tongue when you move on to a dominant language. So these days with multilingualism, people have what we call dual language competencies. Dual language doesn't only mean two, it means more than two. And posits that the acquisition of a mainstream language does not necessarily mean the loss of your mother tongue, the loss of your identity as a speaker of that language. All right, so we have addictive bilingualism and subtractive bilingualism. This is another study by Wong, again looking at a Chinese community, in, um, and she was looking not at a Teochew community, because as you know, the Chinese, we have different dialect speaking, and they were speaking Hakka. And here she brings in the issue of religion. Remember, I talked to you about religion, the religious domain. So she looked at a Hakka Catholic community and she looked at language in religious activities in home. And she found, <coughs> this researcher called Wong, found that children tended to have different views from their parents in terms of use of Hakka. They found that these younger people considered it um, that if they understood Hakka, if they understood that's, that's sufficient for them to be considered a Hakka. Malay was the important language for them because Malay is the national language. For education, Malay was important. Hakka dialect is part of their culture, must be passed on to their next generation. So for them, Hakka was important. Mandarin was important because you have many Chinese schools that teach ma uh, Mandarin is the medium of instruction and is an identity marker of being a Chinese in Malaysia. So Mandarin is seen <coughs> uh, as important. But uh, so we see that for this Chinese community, they were very pragmatic. Where do I use Malay for education? Where do I use English? Where do I use Mandarin? Where do I use Hakka? So Hakka is my identity marker. Where do I use Mandarin? If I meet up with other Chinese, I would use Mandarin. If I meet up with other Hakkas, it is an identity marker. 
So whether it's again, I'm again showing you that attitude, attitudinal ideology are important issues to look at perceptions about uh, a language. And these perceptions, these attitudes, or these ideologies can vary across generations. Next one, please. Next slide. Now, I move on to a, a, a concept that, that is often used these days by a lot of linguists, and this is the concept of translanguaging. And this is actually meshing of languages, mixing, the word is used is meshing, I put it in bold for you, meshing of languages, meshing of dialects, mixing them all together. Um, and he, Kurt Christiansen, in 2016, wanted to look at Singapore. I've given a lot of examples of Malaysia and Singapore. Um, I tried to find examples of India, and I actually went on the web and typed Indians in India and language maintenance shift studies, and I couldn't find too many studies. I, I found a lot of work by Kavita Rastogi, but I couldn't find many. When I said Indians, they normally took me to the Lugus in New York and so on, to different parts of the world. And I do hope that you, you will do studies of the various Indian groups in, 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 in India. Anyway, Kurt Christiansen in 2016 wanted to look at Singaporean family members and how they looked at language policy in everyday face-to-face -face inter interactions. And um, in Singapore, um, we have English, but we also have a variety of English, which, which is seen as uh, a mixture of many languages uh, and a low variety of English known as Singlish. Uh, and he discovered that Singaporean children and even some parents in a uh, the Housing Development Board community negotiated this government policy by resorting to translanguaging strategies, that is, the mixing of languages. So in one utterance, you would have a mixing of Mandarin and the dialect, Chinese dialect, Teochew or English, or even the lower variety of English, the mixture of English with local varieties known as Singlish. And it's, it's actually vibrant, but we as linguists, as pure linguists, we, some pure linguists tend to look down at this, but this is reality, this is what people are doing. So uh, they mix languages together. And uh, in America, Kana Raja actually did a study where he looked at Tamils. Uh, Kana Raja comes from Sri Lanka, but is settled in America and he's done a lot of work on translanguaging and he did an ethnographic study looking at the life of Tamils, young Tamils in Lancaster, in, in the UK and in Toronto, in Canada and he noticed that they displayed what he calls multiple identities. So according to the activities in which they were participating. So for example, if they were with the family at a religious gathering, they would pr probably use their mother tongue. But if they were meeting their friends, there would be a mixture of Tamil and English, either British English or American English. And they shuttled, they moved between com uh, different la languages, English, Tamil, or a mixture of both, depending on who they were speaking with, older or younger or peers, where they were speaking with these people and what the domain was, whether it was a religious domain, what was the purpose of the, uh, of the talk? Was it to negotiate friendship, signal friendship or signal ethnic identity that we belong to the same community? So this is the reality, you know. We talk in theory about maintenance, we talk about shift. The reality is in a multilingual world, being multilingual speakers, we tend to move from one language to another and sometimes we merge the languages together too. Let's move on. <coughs> So our focus is what's the reason 
Why are people doing this? Why are they mixing the language? What is the agentive use of whatever linguistic resources that are available to them? What is the reason they are mixing languages? When do they mix? When do they not mix? It is to achieve their communicative aim. So as I said, if they want to show identity, maybe they use their ethnic language. If they want to show uh, difference, maybe or they want to show that they are mixing more with um, English speakers, then they would use more English. So such everyday practices have resulted in what Kanaraja calls code mashing, but it's nowadays known as translanguaging, also code mixing, code switching. Uh, and um, actually there are so many terminologies used to show uh, this mixing and meshing of languages. So different researchers have used different terminologies and I thought I would share with you these different terminologies like blackledge and crease, they use the word flexible bilingualism, meaning you move from one language to another or you mix the languages. And uh, metrolingualism, where in a city you use uh, more of one language. So you know, these are different terminologies. Which terminology, and I'm not going to give you the definitions of these terminologies, you can easily look them up. Uh, but basically, the current one that is being often used is translanguaging. And uh, Garcia uses it quite a lot. Kanaraja uses it quite a lot. So to put it simply, language maintenance, we can't talk about language maintenance. We are becoming multilingual wherever. I'm sure all of you speak more than one language. We are not minority languages, language speakers. We are multi-language speakers. And which language we speak will depend on who we are speaking, where, why, what is our ideology? Why do we use one language against another? Why do we mix the languages? What is our reason for doing so? What is our communicative aim? So as researchers, these are the things you have to go behi behind the mind of the speaker. So it's more the psycholinguistic reasons, the attitudinal reasons why people use the languages they use. So in social linguistics, we look at language use, but in psycholinguistics, we want to know why they are doing this. Why are they mixing languages? Are they wanting to show common identity? Are they wanting to show uh, a, a reason to show that we belong to the same community? Yeah, let's move on. Now, this is something fairly new, the notion of new speaker. And uh, through these webinars, I met up with Anik Nandi, and Anik Nandi has given a paper, a webinar in Kavita Rastogi's uh, presentations in her webinars. And I asked him for a definition for new speaker, and this is the definition he sent me. A new speaker is a person who did not learn the minority language through intergenerational transmission in the family or through exposure to its use within the local community, but instead acquired it through the education system and currently uses the minority language at varying degrees in his or every or her everyday life. That's really interesting. So here is language being revived through new speakers, language revival through new speakers, where we are not focusing on the home domain, we are not focusing on intergenerational transmission, we are looking at its education system, new schools being created for them to learn their own mother tongue. So where in the past we looked at, this is the duty of the mother, the grandmother or the grandfather to, to disseminate his language to his younger generation. But now we are saying, no, let's try through the education system. And Jaffe too in 2015 uh, has a definition for the new speaker in the International Journal of Sociology of Language. If you're interested, you can read that paper. So what is the new speaker? Um, it's actually, we are looking at the education system, creating schools to teach members of a community who have lost their mother tongue to learn the mother tongue 
through the school system. All right. So the new speaker is in direct con contrast to the native speaker. The native speaker learns it in the home domain, but the new speaker learns it in the schooling system. And then we look at issues of what age does he learn it in the school system? How does he learn it? Uh, what kind of knowledge is he learning? Is he le learning cultural competence or pragmatic competence or purely linguistic competence? How often does he use this new uh, this language that he's learning in the school? Why does he use it? Is it to identify himself as a member of the community? And so on. Can we move on, please? So what is the definition of new speaker? They have been defined as adults who acquire social and communicative level of competence. And as I said, is it just language, linguistic competence? pragmatic competence or metalinguistic competence, that is knowledge about the language. Why do they speak it? When do they speak it? Um, do they only use it in the classroom? Do they use it to in their work at home or only in the classroom? Do they use it only in informal context or do they also use it in formal context? Why do they use it? Do they want to be recognized as a member of the community? Right? So if you want to know more about the new speakers, you read work done by Bernard Orok and Anik Nandi, who examined new speaker parents who have made a conscious decision to bring up their children in Galician language which they themselves did not acquire in the home. So now we are actually telling the schools, you teach, by, you teach your children our ethnic language because we are not teaching them. We, the parents and grandparents, are not teaching them this in the home. Yes, next one. We are almost coming to the end. And this is another study by Anik Nandi and his colleagues where they look at Galician diaspora, not in Galicia, but in Buenos Aires where there is a huge Galician community, a diaspora of the Galician community. So you can look at diasporas, like the Sindhi community is diaspora. I did a study of the Sindhi community in London. I did a study of the Sindhi community in Singapore. So that's the diaspora. So I was looking at their, uh, uh, whether they were maintaining or moving away from their language. Uh, so in this study, Nandi and his colleagues actually look at the role of the school that teaches, the new speakers, you know. Um, and uh, this is another example of another language creating new speakers. And I will not go on to that. You can read that study. Move on to the next. All right. Now, uh, couple of terms that I want to quickly describe to you. One is known as hierarchy of languages. And this is a power, what language is powerful, what language is not powerful. And this is the social construct. At the top of a language pyramid, we normally see the na national language of the given society. And if this is not English, it, English follows very closely. Like in Pakistan, Urdu, English follows. In fact, English is very important in many official domains, even in Pakistan, even in the court domain. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, so after English, we have other languages which are thought in Malaysia. Mandarin is very important too. And the bottom positions on this hierarchy of languages are regional minority languages or indigenous languages, right? So, uh, so uh, I won't talk so much about Sanskrit, but I did talk to a professor of Sanskrit today who lives in America, who is a professor in the University of Illinois. And she, I talked to her about Sanskrit and she told me that Sanskrit is being revitalized in America. And uh, I wonder whether Sanskrit is alive in India, but uh, I, I know it's alive in the religious domain, but she says it's being revitalized in America, even among the Americans because of yoga. And among the Hindus, Indian Hindus, it's also, it's because of the religious domain and where at one time English was being used in a lot of the religious, uh, uh, of the press, 
for marriages. Now the young people say they want Sanskrit when they, uh, when the prayers for marriage prayers and marriage rituals are being conducted. So this is the revitalization of the Sanskrit language in America. And this is something new. It's not in your PowerPoint, uh, but <coughs> I, I talked to her today because I wanted to share this bit with you. Yes, next one. And now we talk about minorities. I talked to you just now about languages uh, and we have different types of minorities that, you know, so we have what we call the dispersed minorities. The Gypsies, the Romas, the Sindhis, they're spread all over the world. They have no home country. These are known as dispersed minorities. Would they maintain their language or would they move away from their language? Then we have diaspora minorities like Turkish communities in Germany. Uh, when I went to Berlin, there's a whole Turkish community and they tend to live apart from the German. So they, they tend to maintain their, their language, but they learn German too because this is the language of the school. Then you have what you know as sub-state minorities where, for example, the Basque or the Catalans where uh, they are given the rights to maintain their own language because there's a fear that they might, uh, if they're not granted these rights, they will become a threat to the stability of the larger nation state that they are part of. So uh, minorities languages, as I showed you just now, uh, digital means, especially during this COVID time where social media and digital means have become so important, uh, digital means are being used to revitalize languages. And um, let's move on to the next slide. And these are two terms that I want to talk to you about. I've talked to you about addictive and subtractive bilingualism, but I want to talk to you about focalization of languages. This simply means language, the minority language, the mother tongue, is re re uh, restricted only to politically insignificant contexts like songs and dances. Um, Co-modification, on the other hand, means uh, the language becomes uh, a commodity, from the word commodity. So Raman, in his book, in his article, Language in Society, Language Ideology, Identity and the Commodification of Language, explains that in the call centers of Pakistan, what happens is a lot of Pakistanis have to learn to speak uh, English with a near native American or British accent because the language is being brings them a job, brings money. So in the call center, when they are answering, um, you can know uh, they have to take near native accent so they're not recognized as Pakistanis speaking English. But, but people who are American speakers or British speakers. Okay, yes, let's move on. Diglossia is another word that you should know as students of social linguistics, uh, where you have more, uh, where languages are important to you. And this is an example of a minority ethnic community, one of the first peoples in the community in, in Malaysia, known as a Semai community. Uh, they have an in-group language and an out-group language. So when they speak to outsiders, they use Malay, but in their own community, within their own Samai people, they use their in-group language. So this is diglossia where you have uh, the sample population have a high perception of their own language, their Samai language and their Samai vitality. They have a positive attitude towards their language because they perceive it as being a substantial part of their identity, their cultural identity. But at the same time, living in Malaysia, they have to mix with others, so they use Malay with others. So diglossia, the use of more than one languages, equals stable diglossia. Yeah? Next one. Uh, I won't speak too much to you about identity. This is a whole new research area. But I just wanted to alert you about the issues of identity if I don't speak my language, how else can I be known as a member of the community? The argument that was put was that without your language, you lose, you lose your identity. 
now. Is that true or not? Woodward comes up with the identity theory and he talks about cultural, he says, apart from language, there are cultural patterns, the food you eat, the clothes you wear, this makes up your individual's worldview. And so your cultural norms from your own community can be seen in the, in, 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 um, the clothes you wear, in the religion you follow, in, in, in the food you eat, in the friends that you have. So these are the cultural issues. But I think that the issue of identity without language, because many research papers, they talk about language showing identity. But if you want to move into a new research area, perhaps you can look at if you have lost your language, if you have moved away from your mother tongue, how is your identity depicted, your identity as a member of that community? And... Uh, this is something that you should think about as a new research area. Um, there's a word there in the last line, portmanteau identities, uh, where you live in a different country, but you also have your cultural experience, your lived experience, and you mix with other people, but you mix within your own community too. So uh, you have what we know, what we call a portmanteau identity. Like for example, in Malaysia, uh, I would say I'm a Malaysian Indian, but a lot of my friends say we are Malaysian Cindy's. So whether you want to know, be known as part of your ethnic community or you want to be known as the larger Indian community. So that's the portmanteau identity. How do you identify yourself? Next one. Now, I wonder how much time I have. I just want to talk very quickly to you about methodology. How do you collect all this data? How do you do research about uh, maintenance or shift or, or, or vitality? How do you do this? And there are many, many ways. And I have actually collected a whole lot of uh, methodologies and a lot of research to show you. But because of time factor, I will go very quickly through it. You can do it like what Aziz and Emery did. They were looking at Ache. And what she did was she started talking to people of the Achinese community. She started talking to them in Achinese. And then she wanted to see what their response was. And because um, the Achinese are uh, also Indonesians, uh, so they would answer in Bahasa Indonesia, they would answer in the Indonesian language rather than in Achinese. So this was a way that she collected data to see if she starts the conversation in Achinese, would they reply in Achinese? And she found that many of her respondents would not respond to her in Achinese because they did not see her as an Achinese. They would respond to her in Indonesian language. So for in-group, but with their own friends who were Achinese, they would use Achinese. So remember, I told you about attitudinal. With my own people, I use my mother tongue. With you, outsider, I better use the national language, Bahasa Indonesia. Next one. Now, this one I think uh, I did mention to you and uh, basically here the researchers look at the languages used by older and middle generation. I put it in bold in the second paragraph and they noticed that the middle generation used code switching and multilingual conversations which I talked to you about mixing of languages, meshing languages, all right? And one variable that caused this was maybe inter-ethnic marriages, uh, uh, Hokkien marrying a Teochew, for example. All right? So this was the study. You can look at these studies later, but here I put in bold what the results were and what the methodologies were. All right? Next, next one. Here was interview data looking at the religious domain uh, the focus was the religious do domain. They interviewed the priests, they interviewed church members, and they also had participant observation. And they noticed uh, what was the language used in the church, 
what was the ideology. I keep focusing on ideology because the ideology will affect the choice of language. What you think about a language, about your own mother tongue, who you are speaking to, and what language should I use with this person depends on who the person is, what the topic is, and where I'm speaking to the person. Next, please. Uh, yes, this is a repetition. Next one, please. All right. Now, here I want to... This is important. Please be sensitive to the community you research. We should always be sensitive to the people we are studying. You know, you see, this community is not using their language. Maybe I should revitalize their language. Maybe I should start schools for them. Maybe I should make them new speakers of the language. But linguist Peter Lady forget in 1992 explained that some Kenyan communities were proud that their children were growing up speaking national language, so Hali, rather than their own mother tongue. Why? Because this was an opportunity for the young people to escape rural poverty. So you see, we cannot force a community to start using its mother tongue. We cannot force it upon them. We must know why they are moving away from their mother tongue. You know? Um, in fact, uh, in a study that uh, Mohana Nambia, uh, this was a PhD study that she did under my supervision, where she was looking at the Malayali community in Malaysia, and uh, she was looking at Malayali Muslims, Malayali Christians, and Malayali Hindus. And she was uh, interviewing them, having questionnaires, observing them, um, she was using all types of methodologies to see what was their dominant language. And she found that the Malayali Muslim community was moving to Malay, whereas the Malayali Catholic and the Malayali Hindu community were moving to English. And, um, and the reason why they were moving to Malay was that Malay was the national language and Malay in the Malaysian constitution has a definition which in their mind would empower them and give them certain rights. So uh, different communities have different reasons. So here um, in this study, Leda Forget actually shows that this community uh, wanted to move away from their tribal language. They wanted to speak the national language, this Kenyan community because they wanted to escape the rural poverty. So as linguists, we don't come in and say, ah, oh, they're losing their language, you must help them to use their language. No. We have to find out why. Why? And once we find out why, then only can we make a decision, how do we help them? Do we need to help them revitalize their language or not? As linguists, we think it's very important to have maintain language because language is so rich language. You learn so much from language, but we need to find out why have they shifted away? Is there a reason? So we must be sensitive to the community. Um, we must look at their attitudes. And this study, you can, you can read it for yourself, but it's different because they were looking at the Brohi people in Pakistan and whether they were moving, they were moving towards Sindhi or whether they were retaining their own Brahi language. And if they were moving to Sindhi, why were they moving to Sindhi rather than using their own Brahi language? So this is looking at attitudes. This is another kind of study looking at attitudes. And I have bold attitudes and the word interview. So they did a lot of interviews to find out. Yeah, next one, please. Next slide, please. Okay, now, these are again terminologies which I thought you should know. What is borrowing? What is code switching? When you code switch, you alternate between languages. And if you code switch too much, chances are, if you see at one time, if my the older generation of Sindhis, they tended to code switch. They would use Malay words or English words in their basically dominant Sindhi sentence or Sindhi utterance. But now we find the opposite, where they use mostly English, 
with one or two Malay words or one or two Sindhi words. And so code switching is the use of different uh, words. But when you borrow, you borrow and it becomes assimilated into the other language. So for example, the word assimilasi is a Malay word which has been borrowed from English. So it's a Malay word, but that's not code switching. Code switching is where we move between languages. So if I say to you, uh, today I would like to talk to you about the Sindhi language because Sindhi suti I. So you see what I'm doing? I'm code switching and mixing between languages. All right? Okay, move on then. Do we have time to do this? Uh, Aditi, do we have time? Ethics? Okay, I just want to tell you. Yes, yes, my. Okay. This is the last slide. Uh, I'm moving away from all the things I've talked about, but this is when you are a researcher. As a researcher, you need to have consent on your participant. And I noticed that in all my years as a lecturer and as a student, no one talked to us about consent forms and consent participation. So I thought um, uh, maybe very quickly I will talk to you about consent. Uh, so if you are doing a study, you, uh, you need to get information. To get the information, you must get the consent of your participants. So you must explain to the participant that why you are doing this research, you must make sure your participant is not so young that he understands he's competent to give consent. You're not saying I would give you ten dollars or ten hundred rupees if you do this. You're not. Uh, he's not under duress. You are not inducing him to do the research. You have to tell him you can withdraw from this research anytime you like. And you must get him to sign an information sheet so that next time, if anybody wants to point fingers at you, you have the information sheet which the participant has signed that he's willingly participated in this uh, research. And uh, particip the information must be written in a language that the participant can understand where you have your title of your study. You have a brief summary of what you hope to achieve in your study. For example, I want to know what is your dominant language. I want to know what's the main language you use in school or in the house. Um, uh, how uh, you have to tell him how the data will be used. I'm using it for my thesis. Uh, is there any risk to the participant? No, I'm just asking you for some information. There's no risk to you. Or if there is a risk, you must tell them what is the risk. All right. Next slide. So this is an example of a form that you could give to your participants. You invite them to take part in your research project. You ask them to read the information sheet. Uh, you tell them that they can ask you any questions if they don't understand any questions. They can, they can call you. Uh, you tell them you're interviewing 20 people or 50 people, people about what? About maybe their choice of language, uh, whether you want to see whether the, the language they choose, there's a correlation between this and their level of education. You tell them that you're asking the same question from everybody. Uh, and you need it for your dissertation. Um, uh, you give them all this information, you know, and you say that, you know, I have chosen you because of your response to an advertisement I put, put on my Facebook. You tell them how long the interview will last uh, and that you will put it, uh, you will transcribe it and it is secure, nobody can get it. Um, and it will be stored for one year, two years, three years, and then it'll be destroyed. And then nobody will look at it except myself and my examiners. So you give them this assurance. So this is on the form, the information sheet. Uh, in the University of Malaya now, this is becoming very important. I suppose it depends on which university you are with, uh, the importance of uh, ethics and the use of the information sheet. One of my students went to Australia to do his PhD. 
this was very important in the university he was in in Australia. So many universities in the third world are now focusing on a form like this for your participants who are participating in your research. All right, I've taken a lot of your time, one and a half hours, uh, but I'm, I'm open to questions if you have any questions. Oh, this is a whole lot of uh, research, uh, reading materials that you could look at. Thank you very much, Maya. As it uh, always is, it's a pleasure to lis listen to you. It's very enriching. It, I'm personally benefited, and I'm sure all the students and all the guests that have participated in today's uh, presentation will be benefited from your lecture. And uh, especially the topic is so relevant, and we are seeing it everywhere. Even uh, COVID is affecting this whole situation very uniquely. For example, the indigenous people, people speaking endangered languages are disproportionately affected by COVID. So this is also affecting more towards language shift and death. So we have a few questions. Uh, for that, I, was, I have a theoretical question. I was wondering, what are, what are your opinions on this? You have talked about translanguaging, and especially in... Um, in you know post postmodernist view of linguistics, uh, which denies the existence of uh, separate uh, individual discrete languages, how do we uh, situate the whole study of language shift within that uh, concept where we are denying the existence of languages, uh, separate languages that is? You see, when people. Uh people shift away from their languages. We know that people do tend to shift away. But then there may be addictive bilingualism or there may be subtractive bilingualism. And I think in today's modern world with multilingualism becoming so much of a feature, uh, many communities speak more than one language. In fact, when I did the study of the Sindhi language in Malaysia, I was afraid initially in the early parts of the study that I would find that there was subtractive bilingualism. In other words, they move away from Sindhi and they move towards English. But in fact, it was addictive because they moved away from Sindhi, but there was addictive uh, bilingualism because they learned English and Malay. So many of them are now bilingual in English and Malay. Uh, and it's the older generation who have uh, a receptive knowledge of the Sindhi language. They may not use it, but it's there. It's, uh, it's, it's understood. It's a receptive knowledge of the language. So in relation to your question, uh, multilingualism is here, minority languages, Communities are losing their minority languages, but they are gaining other languages. So whether they want to, whether they want to retain their minority language, uh, as I said earlier, you have to focus on their ideology. Why have they left their minority language behind, their mother tongue behind? Why? You know, we need to find we, that as linguists, we cannot just focus on, we must help them revive, we must help them to revitalize, you know? Did I answer your question? Right, right. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, yes. Because uh, yeah, we need to rethink the, our whole concept. We want lang all languages to you know flourish, to continue living on. But then, um, then it there are so many factors. There are so many factors that are in, into play. So uh, we have to, as a as a scholar, we have to be mindful of all these things factors that are coming into play. And we have a question from our student, Onindita Roy. She's talking about um, language uh, and identity in the context of uh, bilinguals who always use code switching in, and code mixing in their conversation. So what kind of identity do you think, as a scholar, we should ascribe them? Which is the dominant language in their code mixing and code switching? Which is the dominant language? I yes. think I would look at the dominant. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. 
yes ma'am uh, the dominant language is supposed to be the identity but in that case uh, if we if you consider us like we are bengalis that is supposed to be our cultural identity but uh, we are not using bengali as much as a bengali is supposed to do we are using english we are using hindi in that case we are not even using our own mother tongue so then what is our identity how is the fact that you are using bengali and you are enmeshing it with other languages you're mixing it with other languages there must be a reason why you are using bengali english and uh, hindi you know uh, uh, so when you mix the languages you do them sometimes consciously sometimes unconsciously all right, right. so um if we were to look at that you would want to see why am i mixing languages remember i was talking to you about psychological reasons why people mix languages sometimes they do it consciously sometimes they do it unconsciously it's become a part of their uh, speech patterns all right i am very aware that i when i'm speaking in a webinar i need to use only english but when i mix with my malaysian friends i tend to mix two languages a little bit of english and a little bit uh, a lot of english and a little bit of malay so i tend to mix and there's a reason for yeah. that identity also um, partners within the same nation right so why do you mix hindi why do you use english uh, you know, you ask yourself these questions, and if you say your dominant language is Bengali, is that because you want to show your identity as a Bengali? I think in these uh, questions, yes. we need to ask the speaker questions like why, and make them aware of the reasons. And sometimes they may say, "No, I automatically, I always do this," you know. But uh, then it's a subconscious reaction to language choice. I, hope, I don't have answered. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. 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 I think I can add that uh, we can also question the whole question itself because we can also question whether um, the, the concept of identity is a static one. Identity can also be dynamic. There's no, we don't have a single identity, but multiple. So, um, Orundhuti uh, Ghosh, our student, she asked two questions. The first of all is that when a, what happens to the language of uh, rituals and religious religious rituals, especially when uh, a language community completely shifts from the native language? And the second question is a very interesting one: that if a community completely want, have no motivation to motivation to um, use their language, then who decides that? this language needs to be revitalized. Okay, let's take the second question first. Who decides the language needs to be revitalized? Uh, many, many linguists go into a community and then say they're losing their language. We need to revitalize the language and maybe we need to document their language and so on. So as I said, first they have to decide whether they need to document if they need to document then they start collecting data and then they document it and they archive it they archive it digitally or uh, in text in written text or nowadays mostly digitally uh, and then uh, by talking to the community if members of the community express an interest in maintaining their languages then maybe they can come up with ways to help the community to 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 revitalize their language but if the members of the community have no interest in revitalizing the language you can't force a language into a community's mouth you know so you have to find why what is the ideology why do they want to move away from their language uh, um, that's important i think i think uh, many researchers just assume that languages have to be revitalized they don't think about what is they don't focus on the community's needs and the community's reasons for moving away from the language so as a researcher, I, I would go slow. I would want to know why have they shifted away. I would want to know, do they want to have their language back? 
I would need the cooperation. I, I just listened to a talk by a doctorate student from London just two, two nights ago, and he was saying that we need the cooperation of a community when we want to revitalize their language, when we want to document their language. We need to work hand in hand with the community. And if the community itself is not interested in in reviving their language for some important reason. i give you an example. In Malaysia, at one time, soon after independence, we had schools. We had one school in Kuala Lumpur, which had Punjabi as the medium of instruction. Over the years, the number of students entering that school, Punjabi speakers, they stopped going to the school and the school was closed down. So it is the community itself that did not see a reason for going to a Punjabi, uh, to going to a government school with Punjabi as the medium of instruction. All right. So we have to see what are the needs of the community, of the ethnic community, and whether they have put premium on their mother tongue. So that's the second part of your question. What was the first part? Sorry. What was the first part? Who was the, the first one was what, what the first part was what is happening to the religious uh, language of the rituals, especially the religious rituals. Okay. I was I was just telling you that I was talking to Professor Rajeshwari uh, in the University of Illinois. Uh, She's a professor emeritus in the University of Illinois. And she was saying to me that at one time, uh, in certain religious rituals for wedding ceremonies, there was a bit of mixture of uh, English. But now the young people want the Sanskrit traditions to go back. So there is a revival and interest in reviving Sanskrit in the religious traditions. So she is actually working on a research manuscript on revival of Sanskrit. So it is the needs of the community that have come forth, which, which has resulted in this need to revive Sanskrit because the community wants it, the young people uh, for their religious rituals, especially their marriage rituals, wedding rituals. Any more questions? Thank you very much, Maya. Um, uh, we don't have any more questions, but I think you have uh, answered all the queries very satisfactorily. And uh, yes, we uh, need to, as a, as a researcher, I think we need to go back to the, our descriptive analytic uh, position, even in sociolinguistics. Rather than prescribing that you should be using this language, we should all just try to find out what is happening, if they're shifting. Uh, if it is really a suicide, then are there some abatements for the suicide? We should focus more on that rather than revitalizing the language, probably as social language. That's what I think, and I think that's what you suggested suggested as well. And in this context, uh, you mentioned Anik Nandi's work. He is doing very good, good work, especially uh, focusing on family language policy. And uh, we were very happy to welcome him in a, one of our webinar series, a different one, a few days back. So our students are familiar with his work. So yeah, that, that kind of work can give us a real good insight about what is happening within the community instead of giving a, a you know, taking a view from outside and deciding what's best for the for this community. So it is bas basically a look at within the family. What are the motivations that are happening? So once again, thank you very much. And before we end the uh, this program, I would request our uh, research fellow, Mo Porna Shen, to please offer a formal vote of thanks. Mo Porna? Yes, ma'am. Uh, hello, everyone. Yes, uh, at first, it is, I, I feel privileged to be able to convey the vote of thanks on behalf of my department. And uh, uh, firstly, I would uh, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Professor Dr. De Maya David for delivering this beautiful lecture on language maintenance, shift, uh, re revitalization, and explaining us all the factors and reasons behind it, uh, and providing us with different examples of different situations that uh, take place in different countries. Uh, this lecture was really helpful to us. 
to me particularly and all the students i hope uh, as we could relate the situation that we face in our community and uh, as a country, country as a whole so thank you so much ma'am we are really fortunate that we have you, have you with us today and uh, on behalf of the department though i'm speaking on behalf of the department i would like to personally thank you my department for organizing this uh, this special lecture and uh, definitely i thank uh, the host and the student team whole student team who made it possible uh, who put in so much efforts to make it possible and last but not the least the participants for their active participation and for paying attention to this lecture and staying with us till the last thank you so much i uh, i hope that our de our department will organize such a lecture again and we'll have uh, ma'am with us again thank you but you know thank you very much ma'am Uh, Aditi, if I may say, I I tried so hard to get some uh, yes. studies of uh, language maintenance shift and revitalization in India. I found a lot from Pakistan uh, through the web, but India I couldn't find much. I, I know of Kavita Rastogi's work, uh, but uh, I couldn't mm -hmm. find even though. Uh, Aditi, what you said about uh, COVID and uh, language maintenance and shift, we have actually uh, just co-edited a volume. Many of the writers are from India, and they are talking about how the COVID has affected maintenance and shift, and how um, information about safeguarding yourself during COVID can be transmitted to these minority communities in minor in. Uh, different regions of india uh, and how this information can be transmitted to them in their language so that they understand how to be secure during this dangerous times uh, but um, hopefully this uh, journal True. will be out on the 8th of february and maybe you can read the studies of indian linguists in this journal i will send you the link once it's up Okay, please do, Maya. Thank you very much. In India, I feel we are more uh, focused towards documenting languages rather than focusing on the attitudinal factors or ideological factors. I try a little bit, but there are very few works you have uh, correctly mentioned that. Yes, we should. I think I also think we should focus more about the attitudes and the ideology, the factors that go into language maintenance, rather than document. Yeah, documenting is of course very important, but along with it, we also need to focus on these factors. The, real social linguistic factors so thank you once again thanks to all the participants and uh, yes we do hope to welcome you once again in our department thank you very thank future. you i enjoyed you. sharing with your students thank, thank you. you thank you maya bye bye ma'am bye thanks